Hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, we couldn't be more excited to welcome you all to Annenberg Hall tonight and to hear from the best-selling author, Peter Thiel. We have a full room here, as you can see, but what's really exciting for us is that we wanted to make Peter's remarks as accessible as we possibly could, so he will be live-streamed uh, to the big screen up in the forum um, where many folks are gathered. So let me just take a second to welcome all of you who are watching upstairs on the big screen. Um, I'd like to just take a moment to acknowledge some of our distinguished guests here tonight in the room. Um, Ernie Wilson, of course. Ernie, there you are, Dean of the Annenberg School, who's responsible uh, for this glorious place that we're all sitting in and those great big screens that you're all watching on. Um, Erica Moll, Dean of the Roski School of Art and Design and, of course, Executive Director of the Ivan Young Academy. Great to have you here. And uh, Jack Knott, Dean of the School of Public Policy. So welcome. Um, I'd also um, like to introduce and uh, thank a very special guest, a friend of Annenberg uh, and a friend of Peter's, uh, Alexander Cox of J.P. Morgan, um, who really helped coordinate and put this event together for us. He's going to be joining me up here uh, in just a bit after Peter's remarks to do some questions and answers. And after that, um, we hope to hear from all of you. So let me just take a moment to introduce Peter. Um, I know that you all know him, but Peter Thiel is an entrepreneur and investor and now a best-selling author. Um, he first gained attention um, for really wanting to replace the US dollar. He started PayPal, didn't quite achieve that initial goal, but he did change the way payments work. And he made it possible for hundreds of thousands of small businesses to thrive on the internet. After taking PayPal public and then selling it to eBay, uh, he's become known as the Don of the PayPal Mafia since so many of his former colleagues have gone on to start successful companies. Tesla, LinkedIn, Yelp, YouTube, among them. In 2004, Peter started Palantir Technologies, a data analytics company that makes tools for national security and global finance. Um, that same year, uh, he made his first outside investment in a little company called Facebook, where he continues to serve on the board of directors. And today, as a partner at Founders Trust, and through his own investing, he works to identify and really to support the next generation of technology companies. He also started the Teal Foundation and the 20 Under 20 Teal Fellowship, helping to ignite a debate. I guess we'd call it a debate, Peter, on the differences that exist between learning and formal education. And despite his criticism of the education bubble, uh, in spring of 2012, Peter taught a class. Uh, in the computer science department at his alma mater, Stanford. And he revised that and has rewritten the class notes um, from that course into this book that he's going to talk to us uh, about today, Zero to One, Notes on Startups or How to Build the Future. So I know you'll join me in warmly welcoming Peter Thiel. Peter, thank you. Thank you so much. Well, th thank you very much. Uh, you know, there's so many different directions one can go in, uh, in one of these formats. So I thought I'd um, maybe uh, say a few, uh, make a few comments, and then we'd try to make as interactive as, as, as possible. Uh, what challenges in uh, teaching about entrepreneurship or writing about entrepreneurship is that, uh, is that there's no real formula uh, in, in these things. And, you know, sort of the, the, the normal standard approach to writing these business books is, you know, you have this five-step formula, you follow these five steps and you will be successful. And somehow I, f I think that that's uh, very untrue to the, uh, the experience of, uh, of, of what, uh, what characterizes great businesses. Because I think that every moment in the history of business, every moment in the history of technology happens only once. The next uh, Mark Zuckerberg will not be starting a social networking site. The next uh, Larry Page won't be starting a search engine. The next uh, the next Bill Gates will not be starting an operating system company. And uh, if you're trying to imitate these people, then in some sense, you're not really learning from them at all. Um, and uh, you know, in, in some sense, you could say that science starts with a number two. It starts with things that you can experiment and you can repeat. But um, in the, his the history of business is not scientific in that way because everything happens 
just once and has a sort of very singular character. And so, so one of the strange questions is what can you say at all about entrepreneurship? It's like, you know, if every, if every moment is new, if everything's different, what, what, can, one, um, what can one really say? And so I, I, try to, um, I try to approach this question somewhat more indirectly by, by asking a series of uh, contrarian questions, get people sort of into the right space uh, to think about things. Uh, you know, the, the contrarian business question is something like, what great business is nobody starting? The, uh, the more intellectual version of the question, which uh, I think is a fantastic interview question, is tell me something that's true that very few people agree with you on. Um, and this turns out to be a shockingly hard question to ask people, even when they can read on the internet that you ask this question to everybody who comes in the door. It still is a shockingly hard question. And, uh, and the reason it's such a hard question, I think, uh, is in, it's in part because um, we've been taught that, uh, that truth is simply those things that are conventionally understood. Truth is simply what, what everybody agrees on. And so it sounds like you have to be unbelievably brilliant to have come up with something new that people have not thought of. Um, but uh, even beyond that, I think, uh, I think there's an aspect of it where it always requires a, a certain amount of courage to, um, to state these things. Because if you think about the literal context of an interview where someone's asking this question, uh, and the correct answer, um, uh, you know, if you have some conventional answer like um, our educational system is screwed up or um, you know, the political system in the U.S. is kind of messed up, um, everybody's going to agree with this. These are bad answers. They're not interesting ones. So uh, a good answer is one that the person asking the question probably will not agree with. And, um, and that's why I think uh, socially it's always a very uncomfortable, uh, co uncomfortable kind of a way to get at these things. So what I want to maybe try to do in my brief comments today is share a few of these uh, these um, uh, things that I believe to be true that most people don't agree with me on, and then maybe use that as a starting point for for more of a discussion. <coughs> so the um, the you know the, the first one I think um, maybe takes its bearings quite literally from this um, this idea of uniqueness. Um, most people um, in business and entrepreneurship um, in technology, most people believe that capitalism and competition are synonyms. And I believe they are antonyms. I believe that um, you know a capitalist is someone who's in the business of accumulating capital, whereas a world of perfect competition is a world where all the profits are competed away. Um, if you want to compete like crazy, um, you should just open a restaurant. You will you will never make any money doing so, um, but you will encounter um, an incredible amount of insane competition. Um, and then uh, my sort of my sort of example on the in the on the other side. Uh, the, the kinds of businesses that are really successful are monopolies, and, um, and sort of this is the, the M word, which you're not supposed to use in general. And, uh, and as an entrepreneur or investor or early employee, you always want to join a company that is a monopoly, that is in a category of its own. And the, the paradigm example in Silicon Valley that I, I give is, is a company like Google, which has had a monopoly um, in search since 2002, when it definitively distanced uh, itself from Yahoo and Microsoft, and sort of been printing money um, uh, like crazy for uh, 13 plus years now, and uh, and I think this sort of distinction between monopoly and competition is uh, is very poorly understood, um, in part because, of course, the people inside these businesses don't quite characterize uh, things this way. So if you're running a company like Google. Um, you, you almost never talk about it as a search engine. Um, you have 98% share, or you, have, you have a huge share of the search market, 98% of the profits come from search. It's about 70% of the U.S. search market. And uh, you instead uh, define it as being part of a much larger market, a market called technology, where there's crazy competition everywhere. And Google's competing with Apple with the Android phone. It's competing with Facebook and with Amazon. It's competing with the car companies in Detroit with a self-driving car. And so the official line at Google is that um, it is a technology company, there's competition everywhere, and no, it is not the monopoly that the government is looking for. Um, now, on the, you know, on the other end of the spectrum, <coughs> if you were to leave this talk today and say, you know, I've decided, I figured out what I want to do with my life, I'm going to open a restaurant, um, the, uh, the problem you'd very quickly run into would be that uh, it'd be very hard to get investors to invest in your restaurant because uh, they, they'd say, well, you know, it's a very bad business. They all, most of them go out of business, even the ones that don't never make very much money. I'm not going to give you any money. And then you would have an incentive to come up with an alternate fictional narrative 
that's sort of the, the opposite, whereas you know, monopolies pretend their markets are bigger than they are. If you're in a world of crazy competition, you always come up with a fictional narrative that makes your market smaller than it really is. And so you would say, well, um, no, it's not just going to be a restaurant. It's going to be the only British Nepalese fusion cuisine within a 10-block radius of the USC campus. It'll be one of a kind. And so, um, and so you sort of create this artificially uh, small market. Um, and so I think uh, one of the things that uh, one should always uh, try to do uh, as an entrepreneur, um, investor, someone starting, uh, joining one of these companies, is to, um, is to try to look beyond the rhetoric, to think for yourself, and think about what is the market really, and, uh, and, and not the exaggerated market that monopolies pretend, or the fictionally small market that people who are, um, who are in crazed competition uh, pretend. Um, now, you know, uh, I, th I think that, but I think there's, I think this failure to understand the monopoly uh, problem is not just sort of an intellectual failure. I think it's also, on some level, a psychological or sociological uh, sort of a problem. And um, you know, sort of one, one way of getting at this is, you know, the opening, opening line of Anna Karenina is, um, all happy families are alike, all unhappy families are unhappy in their own special way. And I, I always think the exact opposite is true of business. All happy companies are different because they found something unique to do. All unhappy companies are alike because they fail to escape the essential sameness that is competition. Uh, when um, my chapter for my book entitled All Happy Companies Are Different got excerpted in the Wall Street Journal, they sort of, you know, you sort of work with them a lot on, on editing it and everything, but they get to retitle it. And they change the title from All Happy Companies Are Different to uh, Competition Is For Losers, which had sort of a little bit more of a punch to it. Um, and it has a lot of punch to it because we always think of, uh, it's sort of very counterintuitive, we always think of the losers as the people who are not good enough at competing. The losers are the people who are a little bit too slow on the high school swim team. The losers are the people whose grades aren't quite good enough to get into the right school or the right graduate school. Um, and, um, and we don't think of the losers potentially as the people who are just competing like crazy and end up competing for the wrong things in, in one way or another. Uh, because competition does make you better at that which you're competing on. Um, and so you will, you know, if, you're, if you're obsessed with being on your high school swim team, you will get to be a better swimmer than you otherwise would have been. But, um, but it often comes at this very high price of uh, focusing too much on the people around you and perhaps losing sight of what is truly valuable, important, or, uh, or meaningful. Um, sort of the autobiographical version of this was that I, you know, I grew up in Northern California in a sort of phenomenally... Uh, tracked, competitive sort of a context. Uh, you know, my um, my eighth grade junior high school yearbook. One of my friends uh, wrote in. Uh, you know, um, I know you're going to go into go um, go to Stanford four years from now. Uh, the, the sort of that school uh, somewhere in rural California up north. Um, and you know, I went to Stanford. I went to Stanford Law School. I then ended up at a at a big law firm in uh, Manhattan. Um, and it was sort of every, it was all these, you had these competitions, you had to win them, and when you won the competition, you got to compete again. And if you won that one, you got to compete against people who were even tougher, and uh, sort of a cycle and repeat. And by the time I ended up at the, at the law firm, it was one of these uh, very strange places where from the outside, everybody wanted to get in, from the inside, everybody wanted to get out. When I, when I left after seven months and three days, uh, one, one of the, um, seven months and three days exactly, um, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the people uh, down the hall from me uh, said, uh, it was really reassuring to see me leave. He had no idea that it was possible to escape from Alcatraz, which of course, of course all you had to do was go out the front door and not come back. But, um, but psychologically, this was something that people were not capable of doing because so much of their identity was wrapped up in these competitions that they had won in one way or another. Um, and so, uh, so it actually felt like um, as hard a place to escape as Alcatraz, even though um, this was obviously uh, not quite literally true. Um, you know, it, already in the time of Shakespeare, the word ape meant both a primate and to imitate. And there is, I think there is something very deep in human nature where uh, it is through imitation that we learn language as kids. It's how culture gets transmitted. It's how a lot of ideas get transmitted in our society. But it is also something that can go very badly wrong. It's what leads to crazy peer pressure dynamics. It's what leads to sort of the madness of crowds, financial bubbles, manias, all sorts of uh, strange things in, in one way or another. Um, and so I think there is always this, uh, this very um, you know, odd uh, observation that uh, one gets the sense that 
um, you know, not all of them, but you know, a surprisingly large number of the successful entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley seem to be suffering from a mild form of Asperger's. And, um, and I think we, we should take this fact and turn it around as a critique of our society because what does it tell you about a society where anyone who's not suffering from Asperger's will be talked out of all of their original, interesting, creative ideas before they are even fully formed? Because you'll be able to pick up on all the subtle cues of the people around you and you'll get a sense, oh, that's a little bit too strange, that's a little bit too weird, no, people will think that's funny, you better not do that, you better do something else. Um, and um, and uh, maybe you should just go ahead and open the restaurant. That's very understandable. That's what everybody is doing. Um, and so I think um, you know uh, it's uh, it's obvious that Google's a better business than a restaurant, and yet you have this odd fact that far more people end up um, opening restaurants than trying to trying to start uh, these these truly innovative companies. I think we have to think through all the ways that the uh, the psychology feeds into this in, in different ways. There's sort of always the uh, there's always the anti Aspergers demographic where I think the, the most extreme version is probably something like the business school uh, student uh, demo and I don't want to, I don't want to, I'll just single out business school students just a little bit, I don't want to single them out too much here. But uh, if you sort of look at, they've done these studies at Harvard Business School where you have, uh, you can sort of think of it as a hothouse environment where you have very extroverted people uh, who have no real convictions of their own. Um, they're sort of put into this environment with other people just like them for two years and, uh, and they're trying to figure out what to do next with their lives. And at the end of t the two years, uh, the largest cohort has generally concluded that they should all try to catch the last wave. And it's always sort of the wrong thing. Whatever the largest number of people does is almost always the wrong thing. You know, in 1989, they all wanted to work for Michael Milken just before the junk bond thing blew up. Uh, they were never interested in tech except 99, 2000 when they sort of timed the peak of the dot-com bubble perfectly. Um, uh, it was real estate uh, in the last decade and on and on. So I think, you know, I think, uh, I think the sort of I think when you sort of pull apart this monopoly versus competition idea, you get to sort of some very, uh, some very uh, counterintuitive insights <coughs> um, and it sort of extends in many, many different directions. One, one sort of business application of this monopoly idea that's, uh, that goes in a direction that's very different from the way people uh, normally think about businesses, you're normally told to go after big markets. And, um, and I think um, the key thing is actually to have a large market share. And so it's often better to go after a small market and dominate that market rather than after some enormous market of, of, of one sort or another. Uh, PayPal, um, when we started PayPal, we went after, the, uh, we went after uh, power sellers on eBay, which was a, the small, uh, about 20,000 people. Um, they had an intense need for a better payment solution. And we got from about zero to 30% market share in the first three to four months. And that was sort of a very, very auspicious start. Uh, when Facebook launched at Harvard in 2004, um, you know, the initial market was 10,000 people at Harvard. It went from zero to 60% market share in 10 days. Again, very, very auspicious start. Um, even though if you had framed this as a, as a business pitch, <coughs> it would have generally not been investable pre-launch. I mean, I didn't even invest till they were already at 20 colleges. If you'd, if you'd said, I'm going to start this site and it's, it's, going, to, it's going to be the service for 10,000 people at, at my college. Um, you know, any sort of, uh, the, the conventional business um, school analysis or uh, VC analysis even would have said, wow, that's just a tiny minuscule market. That can't possibly, uh, that can't possibly be any good. And I think something uh, vaguely uh, like the opposite was um, one of the mistakes that happened in the, uh, in the clean tech bubble in the last decades where uh, sort of in the period 2005 to 2008 you had all these companies that were started in clean tech and there's, you know, some of them succeeded, a lot of them different things went wrong and um, I think there was a long list of things that went wrong but, but, um, but one, uh, one somewhat idiosyncratic uh, failure was that um, almost all of them talked about the market in these vast, vast terms and so it was sort of like uh, we're, we're basically um, yeah, so the first page of the PowerPoint presentation would be, we have a market that's measured in hundreds of billions or trillions of dollars. It's this market called energy. It's this vast ocean. And if we get a fraction of a fraction of that market, we'll still have a great company. And you never want to be a minnow in a vast ocean because um, you, know, you will never have it to yourself and you have no idea what else uh, you want to, want to encounter because you will have to then beat you know, not just the other nine thin film solar panel companies, but then you'll have to beat the other 90 solar panel companies, and then you'll have to beat the wind companies and the natural gas companies and the fracking companies that came out of Wrightfield and the Chinese 
cheap manufacturing that came out of left field, and soon enough there was uh, competition everywhere, and uh, somehow it did not work as a as, as a business um, as a business at all. Um, uh, let's see. So so I, I say one. Um, uh, th now I do think um, I do think there are sort of a um, one, one of the things I want to underscore uh, as sort of a second second contrarian idea is that I I think there are actually um, more such opportunities uh, left than we think. You know, uh, and I, I always like to differentiate. If you sort of s describe the answers to my question, uh, uh, tell me something that's true that people don't agree with you on. Um, there there are um, or you know what great business is nobody starting, um, and I, I think you can sort of have a trichotomy of truth. There are things that are conventions which everybody understands to be true. These are not interesting things to start with in business. At the other end of the spectrum are things that are mysteries, which are somehow so hard that nobody in the world can figure them out. And I sort of have this in-between category of things that I describe as mysteries, things that are hard but possible to figure out. And, um, and I think there are a lot of those things left in our world. Now, there definitely are certain areas where probably you know, the, the domain of human knowledge or the, 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 the business space is largely complete. Um, you know, if you, were, if you were growing up in the 17th or 18th century and you looked at a map of the world, there were still some empty spaces on the map. You could become an explorer and go to those spaces. It was going to be a hard thing to discover these secrets of what was going on there. But, you know, there was sort of a way you could go about doing this. In the 19th century, you could have sort of filled in various parts of the periodic table of elements. And so in the early 21st century, probably geography or basic chemistry are not places where you would actually find new secrets to discover. But I think there are actually, <coughs> there are actually many of these domains left. And, um, and I think it's one of the incredibly self-defeating things that we tell ourselves that, um, that there aren't that many secrets around, that, uh, that basically um, um, it's either already been discovered by somebody else or it's impossibly hard because someone you know, uh, someone. If if you if if if, uh, if no one's gotten it, it's too hard to figure out. And I, I think sort of the very first thing one can say to that is that um, if you believe that there are no secrets left to find, then you will not be the person to find them. Um, and I think the reality is that there are sort of many different fields, and it's 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 typically involves something somewhat idiosyncratic. It doesn't involve necessarily pushing the frontier in a conventional field, because when you try to push the frontier in a conventional field, you will again just encounter you know, enormous amounts of competition in, in all these different ways. It comes much more from some sort of new category that people haven't really thought about. When we started PayPal, we were very interested in the intersection of cryptography and sort of finance. And there was, you know, there was a small number of people who were interested in financial cryptography. Um, and that sort of was a really motivating idea how we could create a new world currency. We failed to build the Bitcoin protocol, which people did figure out, you know. 12, 15 years later, um, 13, 14 years later, but um, <coughs> but but having sort of a, some some somewhat idiosyncratic area that you're very passionate about um, is, I think, a way to to anchor this sort of a search for secrets. And this is sort of, um, and I, I think there are a, a lot more of these than we think. They're not just in information technology. I think they're in many other areas. And I think we've told ourselves a lot of somewhat self-defeating stories that um, that sort of the world is flat. Everything's already been discovered, or is impossibly hard. We, we sort of are. We sort of tend to um, uh, sort of have this binary count where everything's a convention or an impossible mystery. Nothing's in between, and I think there's always, always a lot um, in between. Sort of. Let me sort of describe this in a slightly related way. One, one of the questions I often get asked, which um, I don't like that much, but it's sort of, what are some trends in technology? Where do you see things happening? And it always feels like this question where I'm not a prophet. I can't really say what's what's going to happen. It sort of incensed me to come up with all these very banal answers. So it's like, well, there are going to be more people using cell phones in five years, or something like that, which doesn't really, really help you that much. But the, but the general answer I've come up with, is that I believe all trends are overrated. And so if you hear something that sounds like a trend, it's overrated. The more trendy it is, the more overrated it is. And so um, education software, healthcare IT software, these are common buzzwords, common trends. It's somewhat overrated. Too many people are trying to do things. SaaS, enterprise software, way overrated. If you hear the words big data or cloud computing, you need to think fraud and run away as fast as possible. <laughs> and, and, um, <coughs> and it's not that it's inconceivable that there's 
that something could exist in these areas, but it is that the fact that the buzzword exists, they're a tell, like in poker, that someone's bluffing. And so the more buzzwords people use, the more they're bluffing, and the more undifferentiated their business is. And so if you're just one of 100 big data companies, uh, and you define yourself in terms of being a big data company, you fail to differentiate yourself. And again, you don't want to be one of N, you want to be one of a kind. You don't want to be the fourth online pet food company, the 10th thin film solar panel company, the 10,000th uh, restaurant in, uh, in Los Angeles. And, uh, and what I think is underrated, conversely, are, um, are these sort of one of a kind companies that don't really fit into any categories at all um, and that are really somehow very, uh, very unique and different. Um, you know, we're investors in Airbnb, which sort of gets described as the sharing economy, but it's really just this, this very idiosyncratic uh, um, sort of hospitality uh, uh, service that's where people can turn their homes into, um, into bread, and bread and breakfasts. Um, and, and, uh, and, and so I think all the great companies are sort of one of a kind, and they often don't really fit into any categories. Uh, one of the challenges as a, <coughs> as, a, uh, as a venture capitalist or investor is, of course, that uh, people are often, occasionally it happens that people um, will describe their companies in these conventional categories, and they will still be unique. So, um, you know, the rap against Google in 1998 was that it was just another search engine. There already were, you know, a whole bunch of different search engines, um, and I would um, and I would argue that 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 was actually the wrong categorization. The correct categorization was that, that Google was the first machine-powered search, and before that, you just had these human-powered search engines. So it was very different, but you had to sort of um, you had to de uh, describe it uh, correctly. Uh, or Facebook, the the rap against Facebook early on and for quite a while was it was just another social network. These things were sort of fads, they all came and went. Uh, it was certainly not the first social network. One of my, one of my friends, Reid Hoffman, who ended up starting uh, LinkedIn, started a company already in 1997, seven years before uh, Facebook, called SocialNet. And so they had social networking in the name of the company seven years before Facebook. Um, and uh, it, it had sort of all these ideas. You'd have these different avatars in cyberspace, and maybe you'd be a cat, and someone else would be a dog, and we had to have these complicated rules how you'd interact with one another in, in cyberspace. Um, and it turned out that didn't, didn't really take off. Um, and so, so I would say that Facebook was the first company to, to crack the real identity problem. This was not the way it was characterized. It was, it was, I would say, mislabeled as a social network, but it really was doing something that was very different. So, so I think one of the one of the temptations you always have is to characterize what you're doing in terms of these, these set buzzwords, these set labels. Um, um, it's somewhat easier, but it's always, uh, I think it's always uh, very deeply, uh, um, it's, it's, if it's accurate, um, it's a big mistake because you're just, again, uh, going into a space where there's crazy amounts of competition and uh, lack of differentiation. Let me end with, <coughs> let me end with one last, one last, uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, thought, uh, sort of contrarian um, thought, something I believe to be true that uh, many people do not agree with me on. Um, I think that uh, if we sort of think ahead for the 21st century, there's a, uh, there's a tr um, uh, you know, good 21st century will have both more technological innovation and more globalization. And I think uh, these words technology and globalization often get used interchangeably. Um, and I, I would argue they're very, very different. Um, and I always draw globalization on the x-axis, technology on a y-axis to underscore um, how they're sort of different in kind. I think of globalization as copying things that work, doing more of the same. It's horizontal growth, extensive progress going from one to n. I think of uh, technology as um, intensive growth, doing new things, going from zero to one. So globalization is going from one to a hundred typewriters. Technology is going from a typewriter to a word processor. And when we think about sort of bigger sweep, the history of the last two centuries, there have been eras of globalization and of technology, um, and they, they're not necessarily connected. You know, the 19th century was a period of tremendous um, uh, globalization and tremendous technological progress, the period from 1815 to 1914. 1914, World War I starts, globalization sort of goes in reverse, there's less trade, countries become less connected, technology still continues to proceed very quickly on many different fronts. Um, 1971, Kissinger goes to China, and the last 40 years has been a period when globalization has reaccelerated, 
Um, and I would argue we've actually had more limited progress in technology, where technology has been just IT. There's been a lot of progress in computers, uh, less, less in other things. And this, this is sort of um, captured in these very different ways that we describe our world. In the 1950s and 1960s, um, you would have divided the world into the first world and the third world. The first world was that part of the world that was seeing accelerating technological progress. The third world was that part that was sort of permanently screwed up. So this was a pro-technology um, but no globalization picture of the world. Whereas today, we would divide the world into the developing and developed world. Um, and the developing countries are those countries that are copying the developed world. They're co um, converging with the developed world. And so this developing, developed dichotomy is a uh, pro-globalization uh, dichotomy. It sort of says the whole world is going to become more and more alike. It'll become more and more globalized over time. But I think it is also an anti-technological description. Because when we say that we're living in the, uh, in the part of the world that is developed, we are implicitly saying that we're living in that part of the world where nothing um, new can or should happen, where things are more or less done, where things are going to be stagnant, and where uh, the younger generation should have lower expectations than their parents. And I think this is a, a conception of our world that we should resist extremely uh, strenuously. Um, and so I will, I will end uh, with the uh, contrarian question to which I think we should always uh, return more often. How can we go about developing our so-called developed world? Thank you very much. got off a plane from Europe, walked right in, and delivered that talk. So um, among other things, we're appreciative for you for making such a long commute uh, Thanks. to get here. Glad to be here. So as I said, um, Alex and I are going to field a couple questions, and then, um, then we'll open it up to your questions. Alex, sure. you want to start? Sure. So Peter, I think we wanted to start on the title. Um, and your book talks a lot about doing new things, uh, doing what has never been done before, going zero to one. Um, for a lot of people in the room that are thinking about their own ideas, um, there's a lot of what I call entrepreneurial anxiety to be the first, right? The, 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 it, to be unique, you have to be the first one out there, the first mover. But you talk a lot about the last mover advantage, and I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on that. Which one is it? Is it being more important to be the first mover or this last mover advantage? Uh, well, you need to be both. Yeah. You need to be both the first and the last. Um, so you certainly... <coughs> um, Certainly, um, uh, um, let me start with uh, the importance of being the last. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's um, when I, um, we did this exercise at PayPal in March of 2001 where we were looking at, you know, how valuable the company was. And you do sort of discounted cash flow analysis and you have a growth rate, you have a discount rate. And it turned out that about three quarters of the value of the PayPal business came from profits we would be making in years 2011 and beyond. Um, and that's, if you sort of go through the math, that's roughly what you get for any of these companies. If you look at you know, Facebook, Twitter, any of the um, sort of next generation um, uh, software companies today, next generation technology companies, you know, 70 to 80 to 85 percent of the value comes from profits they'll be making in years 2025 and beyond. Um, and so we're always, you know, so to have a successful company both to grow and to endure, we tend to focus too much on growth because it's measurable. We don't focus enough on the question, will the company last, because that's a much more qualitative one. Uh, I think there's sort of some indirect you know, qualitative ways one can get at it, but I think it's an extremely important question to get at. So, uh, so definitely all the great companies are ones that in some sense you know, grew a lot, but then also really lasted. It's not enough to just sort of grow, uh, grow fast and then you know, blow up as people um, get tired of it. You don't want to be sort of a nightclub where, you know, it's hot and then it's not or something something like that. Um, now I think I think at the same time you also have to be you know you know by definition in some sense you have to be the first you have to you know because if someone else had already done precisely what you're doing yeah. um, there'd be no opportunity to do it um, with again the caveat that sometimes the categories have to be defined properly so Google was not the first search engine but it was the first machine powered search Facebook was not the first social network but it was um, the first uh, real identity company that crack real identity. So, so I do think you have to be the first in some important dimension, yeah. but then um, um, equally important, you also have to be 
uh, the last. And I think all the great companies have what I describe as the last, this last mover advantage. You know, so the, the chess analogy is that you know, uh, you know, in chess, you know, you have a small advantage as, as white, but uh, but you really win if you win the end game. It was, uh, it was Capablanca, the former world chess champion, who said you must begin by studying the end game, and uh, and I think it's worth to have at least a little bit of that perspective when you when you start one of these things. Peter, when you talk about vertical progress, zero to one, how do we make sure that that ability, the ability to create, nurture, support, fund new technologies, new breakthroughs, new companies, is accessible to all? How do we make sure that this zero to one um, follows the Silicon Valley model in some ways, but not in the area that is less commendable in terms of its lack of diversity? Well, um, let's see. So I, th I think, you know, I, I certainly think Again, I think there's no sort of one-size-fits-all approach for uh, for for any of these uh, these kinds of things. There are there obviously are all these challenges where there's not enough. You know, it would be it would be good if more people had access to to uh, to you know learning computer science, to learning various other engineering disciplines, to to uh, to various other fields. Um, I do um, as you know, so I'm a little bit of a partisan of Silicon Valley here, and so um, I do think um, you know there's always sort of this um, way to blame Silicon Valley. For for not doing more, um, you know, we like I like to always blame Silicon Valley for not doing enough on the technology side. So we have a you know, tagline on our um, on our Founders Fund website is uh, they promised us flying cars and all we got was 140 characters, which is a little, little bit of a <laughs> crack at Twitter. Um, and um, and there certainly are ways you can blame Silicon Valley for being too focused on IT or not doing enough on other things. But I think it's really it's really a problem. Um, you know, it's it's really a problem. You know, everywhere else. If, if you if you ask me, you know, um, how do we get uh, more diversity in terms of the uh, the the people in these uh, in these companies? I think um, you know I think it's often framed as an engineering problem or problem of um, getting more executives. Um, you know, I actually I actually think it should be reframed as a question about the founders because I think it's the founders that end up uh, setting the real example and setting the cultural template. And there's something extremely special and important about uh, the founding moments of these companies. I don't have an answer to how you do that, but I think, um, I think so long as we're talking only about employees or executives, we're not even tackling the real problem, which is how do you, uh, how do you uh, change the, the, the caliber and um, the narrow range of people who are currently founding these companies. So how do you do that? Well, I, th I, I don't have an answer, but I think that's the question you need to ask. And I think until we ask that question, we're not we're not even we're not even engaging in the real the real uh, real debate. It's not it's not a straightforwardly political answer because you know these these founding moments uh, they often come from people who've worked together for a long time. Right. They've been friends for a long time. You know, it's, it's one of the questions I often ask teams of founders when they uh, come in is the prehistory question: When did you meet each other? How how did you start working together? Sort of the bad answers are things like we met at a networking event a week ago and we decided <laughs> to start a company because we both wanted to be entrepreneurs. Okay, these are really bad answers. Um, and then a good answer is like we've been you know we've been friends for three four years in college and one of us is going to be on the business side and one of us is going to be on the on the tech side, and um, and that sort of a organic answer is one that's uh, that's very uh, that's very uh, that's very promising and that's the kind of thing one would have to. Think about doing differently, but so that but that would, by definition, um, create a collection of people who think alike. And all we hear today is, no, that's not what you want in your founding team or in your management team. You want a group of people who think really differently. That that builds a better business and uh, grows a better business. Well, I think you want people. You know, I think um, I would I would always define. A company, um, a, a great company, is one that thinks differently from the rest of the world, but does obviously. You have to have something in common internally, and so uh, so it's uh, it's it's you you have uh, some agreement on one thing that you understand that nobody else understands. Uh, when my uh, PayPal colleague Elon Musk started SpaceX, um, the founding vision for SpaceX was that we were going to go to Mars, and that this was the most important problem in the world for us to solve, and. You know, not everybody would agree with that, but uh, the the rocket scientists that believed going to Mars was the most important problem in the world were were natural people uh, to join to join SpaceX. So I think I think great companies are often characterized by um, having um, by being both different and alike, where they are they have a uh, a very powerful idea, 
that's very different from an idea anybody outside them has, but it's one that people on the inside do have and that you don't want to, you know, you don't want uh, someone to say, well, you know, uh, we shouldn't go to Mars, we should just go back to the moon, or maybe we should go to the sun, or maybe we should just go into, you know, we should just go up 100 kilometers like Branson, you know, 100 miles is too much, we'll do kilometers, we'll do the metric system. Um, and uh, that, that sort of would not be that constructive at a place like SpaceX. Are there any current founders or aspiring, you know, growing, fast-growing founders that you find interesting or, you know, everyone kind of points to Steve Jobs, right? And after, you know, his passing and all that, was there somebody that's kind of rising that you see as, as strong? You know, I, I, I certainly do, um, I certainly do um, admire a lot of the people that I've invested in and worked with over the years in, in, in Silicon Valley. Uh, it's always... Um, you know, it's it's you have to be sort of careful um, to I think draw the right balance where we don't. Um, you know, I think the founders are special but not godlike, yeah. and so there's sort of some balance in between ordinary and godlike that you want to sort of get the get the right balance. Um, and so I think they are often very charismatic people, but uh, they end up bringing the best out of a lot of other people um, around them. And uh, and so I think, for example, to to uh, uh, just riff on Steve Jobs. Um, my own sense is that he gets constantly misdescribed. You know, the, the biographies on him, it's like he was like this unbelievably mean person and uh, he sort of just uh, beat everybody and was uh, this absolutely awful human being. And that sort of probably begs the most important question, which is like, how did it work at all, if that's the case? You know, or, you know sort of managers that sort of gave the uh, Steve Jobs um, biography to their employees and it was sort of like a warning. Uh, I'm going to start behaving in a more obnoxious manner, uh, because I'm going to be, try to be like Steve Jobs, and so, um, so, <coughs> and so, when you ask what is it that you're emulating in a founder, you have to sort of get it, you know, quite right. And it's not necessarily that you're emulating Jobs' hairdo or his, you know, apples only diet, which he had for you know a month or so, and probably didn't necessarily have anything to do with the fruit apple per se, um, and um, and it's it's the sort of ability to sort of uh, inspire. A group of people uh, to do something um, extraordinary new. And so, when you invest in companies or when you select your fellows, what do you look for in those founders? I mean, obviously the idea, right? The, the answer to your question. But what else do you look for? Well, it's um, so. It's again. It's it's um, it's never. I think it's very rarely a singular founder. So I think I think most companies require. Uh, more than one person to succeed, and this, this is this is I think you know the, the sort of all these. Um, this is probably the single aspect about entrepreneurship that is, uh, I think, most different from an academic context. Because in an academic context, it's extremely individualistic. It's you against everybody, and you have to beat everybody. And when you have group projects, these are normally projects that people don't have to work on that hard. And the thing that really matters are the things that people do individually. Um, and there certainly are certain types of companies where you can do it as a solo uh, as a solo uh, person but uh, <coughs> but I think a lot of uh, um, a lot of these businesses um, require this coordination uh, this bringing together of, of groups of people and uh, we've we've not really been um, we've not really learned to do teamwork terribly well ever you know we, we sort of learned it maybe a little bit in some athletics but it's always this super uh, fake stylized uh, context um, and so and so I think, um, and so I, there are all these like Zen-like paradoxes. You know, it's like you want people who are really stubborn but really open-minded. Uh, you know, and so you often have like these really strong personalities, and they have to somehow work well together. And so, uh, so you sort of know it when you see it. There are many cases where it's just way off, but uh, but I'm very focused on the on the team dynamics. Um, I am at this point very focused on the ideas. Actually, um, you know, I used to I used to have this conceit that all it took was a team of people. Um, and if you had a great team, you could do do everything. And I think the sort of model where we have like four really smart people, and we're going to lock ourselves in a room, and we're going to come up with one idea after another. And if it doesn't work, we'll come up with another idea, and we'll come up with another one. Um, I don't think that's a terribly good business to invest in. Um, and I think that uh, that in some sense, um, these great ideas are actually pretty rare. And so, um, I so I'm, at this point, I'm, I'm very focused on um, on sort of the business strategy. Uh, the uh, the intellectual property. I think if you have those, that's already suggestive that you have something really interesting. Mm -hmm. But it's often you know it's often these combinations are really hard. You know in the um, in the breakthrough technology area or in the science area, where you know, we've done a, you know, a, a decent amount of investing 
biotech, medicine, medical devices. Um, one of the one of the one of the um, great combinations is to have a great scientist with a great businessman, and this is like an unbelievably rare combination to find because the skill sets are so different. The scientists have no idea what a good businessman looks like. The businessmen have no idea what a good scientist looks like. So you know, a scientist will think that a good businessman looks like a used car dealer, and you know, the businessman will look will think that you know a good scientist is someone who looks like Dr. Oz or something like that. You know, uh, where it's something. Um, it's something. Um, it's some sort of fictional, uh, some sort of uh, uh, f fictional uh, caricature of, of of science, and uh, and yet getting that combination right is very critical. So you you mentioned Silicon Valley. So I, I wanted to ask. So entrepreneurship is basically you know coming up with answers and solutions for daily problems. Why is it that you think that the majority of all these answers or zero to one innovations have come from a very small geographical area, and then? Could you ever see LA becoming this place of technological advancement as well, or some type of leader? Like, why is it just in Silicon Valley? You know, any question that starts with the word "why" is unbelievably hard to answer. Um, you know, because why? Um, you know, we, we can say there's been a lot in Silicon Valley yeah. empirically. <coughs> you know, why that is 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 really hard to say. Um, outside of LA, you could say maybe the weather's nice. So Silicon Valley does have not as good as LA, but it has better weather than most parts of the world. Um, there's, you know, there was certainly a university infrastructure. There was a history where a lot of people had innovated. Um, it was a sort of somewhat open culture, um, but, uh, but the, and I think all these things are sort of um, are super um, super overdetermined. Um, you know, I think the I think one standard, you know, my my guess is that one thing that makes Silicon Valley work is that you have a whole series of these things that go together in just the right way. So you have this infrastructure. Both educational and professional, and services. You, have, you, you know, you have the venture capital piece. You have, um, you have a history of success. You have sort of ways in which people can mentor other people, and somehow you have a lot of these these factors that come together in just the right way. But um, but it's possible that a lot of these things also can be negatives. So you know, um, so you know, you, you, the classic version would be that so there are these network effects in Silicon Valley. It's a very powerful network. The negative with a network is that uh, you end up just, um, you know, sort of hanging out with people who are just like you. You become more homogenous. You become more ape-like, sheep-like, lemming-like, and you end up with a sort of a wisdom of crowds, which I think always leads people astray. Yeah. And so there's also a lot of uh, there is a dynamic in Silicon Valley where it is very prone to bubbles and bubble-like thinking at this point. Um, my 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 guess is that um, at this point, I think people could actually start great companies. Uh, you know, in many different places. I think there is a there are certain advantages Silicon Valley has. There also are disadvantages from a cost perspective and and um, and sort of a a manicness perspective. Um, but I think LA has LA is a very promising place. So you know, one one natural way is that you expect Silicon Valley um, you, you expect sort of adjacent places. And there's a way in which LA is actually like an hour hour and a half away from Silicon Valley. And um, it seems there's many ways in which it's more natural than say Sacramento. Um, you mentioned education is one of the factors in supporting supporting innovation and innovation culture. So, what role um, could, should, might higher education play in um, supporting the creation of zero ideas? Well, it's it's um, <coughs> you know I've been um, you know I've been a fairly big critic of the uh, of the uh, university system over the last. By the way, nobody few years. here has noticed. I'm sure. Um, <laughs> So, and uh, you know, I think that it's um, it is um, it's obviously the case that uh, that our um, our universities um, our universities uh, um, are are their magnet where we have a lot of the most talented people go. There's um, there is uh, there is some degree, and I think the you know, I think the question the, the 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 question that's worth asking is is you know when you're I sort of remember my senior year in high school where you had sort of people had all these like incredible aspirations, incredible dreams of what they were going to be doing with their lives. And, and when you sort of look at a lot of those same people at college plus five years, um, it's a surprising degree to which that's been beaten out of people. Um, and, you know, again, I'm not going to answer the why question, <laughs> why, that, why that happens. But, um, but empirically, you know, one, one, of my, one, of my, uh, one of my friends told me that uh, 
uh, I think this was from a very unusual perspective, but the senior year of high school, he was thinking to himself, you know, I'm about to go to that, that place where all of my dreams are going to get beaten out of me. Um, because this is what happens empirically to a lot of other people, right. not answering why. Um, and, um, and, I think, um, and I think that that's something certainly uh, that, uh, that needs to be resisted. Now, I don't think everyone should drop out of college or that nobody should go to college. Um, I'm skeptical of the one-size-fits-all uh, model that we have in our society where you go to Yale or you go to jail. Um, you know, there's, uh, <laughs> there's basically, uh, um, and, um, and I think that, uh, and I don't, have, I don't have an alternate formula. So I don't have, like, there's going to be this different formula where, you know, I don't think everyone should be an entrepreneur. I think entrepreneur is actually a terrible label. Um, it's against the buzzword, bad buzzword. Um, I think, uh, but I, I think that, uh, I think the, the future will be, you know, will be somewhat more, um, somewhat more heterogeneous. The, uh, you know, the analogy I've used uh, is that I think the, uh, I think the university system today um, is in a crisis somewhat similar to that of the Catholic Church circa 1500, where, you know, um, um, you had, uh, um, you know, you have sort of all sorts of debates and divisions between different universities. You had differences between the Dominicans and the Franciscans and, and so on, but it was a universal church. It's a universal education system where, uh, and 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 um, and uh, you know, it's costing more and more. You had the system of indulgences that was costing more and more. Um, and you're told today that uh, you know um, you'll be saved if you have a diploma. If you don't get a diploma, you will go to hell. Um, and I think I think that you know the future will not be some. I'm not trying to create an alternate church. Um, I think the future. You know, it will, uh, it will, my, my message is, is like very disturbing. It's like that of the 16th century reformers. I think uh, people have to figure out how to save themselves, which is the last thing people want to hear. Great. Um, if you're okay with this, I think we're going to go to the audience for um, questions. No pitches, but questions. Yeah, yeah. This is in Shark Tank. Um, maybe right down. Marianne, can you come down? Peter, you recently uh, made a significant investment into the marijuana business, which is contrarian, certainly. Uh, I'm wondering why you chose to invest into a fund, uh, given the capabilities of your team, as opposed to making direct investments. Uh, and what do you think is going to happen on a federal level with, uh, with that whole situation? Yeah, it was a relatively small investment. got a shocking amount of publicity. So uh, <laughs> um, it... Uh, <laughs> it, it, we, we've been looking what, at a, what was the size, by the way? Uh, we invested five million dollars. Okay. Um, um, you know, we have about a billion dollars in our in our fund, so it's you know, where it's a decent size, but not not crazy large. Um, you know, we, we we well, we looked at a whole bunch of different uh, businesses. This seemed like the best group. They had they'd sort of started a few different um, uh, businesses in this in this space. Um, you know, I think one of the you know one of the general. Let me answer this a little. More broadly, I think um, I'm always very interested. Um, you know, I, th I think the regulatory framework for various industries matters a great deal, and <coughs> and uh, what's often very important is um, is when the regulatory context changes. So if you have things that were heavily regulated or even illegal, and they're getting uh, less regulated or becoming legalized, that's often you know a general area where there may be um, maybe a lot of opportunity. You know, conversely, if you have something that's getting more heavily regulated, that's often an area that I think people should be very careful and, and, and stay away from. So we, we spend a lot of time on the other, for example, looking at financial technology as, a, as another thematic area where, you know, on a high level it seems that there's a lot you could do on the Internet with finance and technology. But the, uh, the worry we keep running into is that, um, you know, we're in a world where, um, where the banks are getting outlawed more and more are getting regulated more and more, and you really want to be um, going against the current that much. And I think, um, you know, at this point, uh, you know, marijuana has been effectively legalized in 28 states. It's you can debate whether it's medical marijuana or marijuana, but it's it's basically been. Uh, and I think that trend is is um, is set to uh, to continue and accelerate in the years ahead. And, and on a federal level, level uh, rescheduling the drug or or whatever, did you do a bunch of due diligence to determine your best guess what's going to happen there? You know, I think I think the, I think they will just uh, not enforce the laws, like they do in the Netherlands. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. Think, I don't. I think our you know our political system is pretty broken. So if you actually wait for for the laws to change, you, you might wait for a very long time. But I think um, I think it will just not be enforced. Thank you. Okay, Thank you. We've got one over here. Hi, Peter. Um, 
I was just wondering, is there a difference between the Peter Thiel thinking um, philosophy of um, starting a business and also investing? Um, the reason why I ask that question is because obviously a lot of my friends and I see zero to one as a Bible, but then we look at some of the investments and we think there's some sort, of, sort of like discrepancies over there. One company in particular I'm thinking about is Klinko, which isn't doesn't really fit in, into the zero to one model. Um, let's see. Well, well, I, I don't know. I don't know if I want. I'd want you to. Um, you know, I'd like you to read my book, um, even, <laughs> even if you don't think it's the Bible. <coughs> um, I, I, um, you know, we, we've, probably, uh, we've probably invested in something like 150 to 200 companies over, over the years. There are, um, there are you know, certainly some that have done better than others. There's some, um, uh, you know, there, there certainly are all sorts of contexts where, um, you know, you, you get pitched on things where it's incredibly charismatic, incredibly convincing. And then, uh, and then things um, you know, don't all, always uh, work out quite, uh, quite, um, quite as uh, as the pitch would have indicated. I, I don't like, you know, I don't like um, sort of um, saying, telling, telling stories about how great the companies were invested in. Are always, that feels too self-promotional. But I also really don't like um, saying negative things about calling companies out by name because I think it is, it is always very tough. And even when people, you know, make a lot of mistakes and uh, when a lot of things go wrong, um, you know, it's. Uh, they're having a tough enough time without um, adding to that, so I'd, I'd rather leave it at that. So you talk a lot about vertical growth and horizontal growth, and a lot of the spotlight seemed to be on vertical growth. Um, but so many of our technological advancements aren't spread to the vast majority of the world yet. Like so many people, billions of people aren't on the internet yet. Um, so what are your thoughts on that horizontal growth, and shouldn't we be more concerned about bringing the rest of the world up to the bar as well? Hmm. Well, I think I think um, I think we're I think we're doing both. I think there's both. You know, there is a globalization trend and a technology trend. I I certainly would argue that um, uh, what I would disagree. I, I think I disagree with the premise behind your question. I think um, I think our society is geared towards globalization. And I think it's geared against technology. Let me just uh, let me just. I think our culture dislikes intensely all things scientific and technological. And I, I feel uncomfortable saying this in Los Angeles, but all you have to do is watch the science fiction movies that get produced in this town. Um, and they all portray science and technology that's bad, that destroys things, that's making the world a worse place. And the future is some combination of Terminator or Avatar or Elysium. You know, I watched the Gravity movie the other day. Um, it's like you would never want to go into outer space. You would be happy to be back on that muddy island somewhere. Um, and, um, and I'm not, I'm not you know, I, I don't think it's, uh, it's unfair to sort of single out Hollywood. Um, it is simply reflecting um, our broader society and our broader culture, which um, which uh, is is um, is generally uh, very very anti-technological in all sorts of ways, um, and um, and I think the the, the really countercultural thing um, in our world is to be uh, is to be in favor of uh, of, of radical innovation. Uh, you know, one of the one of the areas I've I've spoken out about um, in uh, over the years has been the need to do more work on life extension, anti-aging research, in in one way or another. And uh, this immediately gets you into this sort of bizarrely uncomfortable zone where people think it's weird, it's creepy, um, and uh, and you know we're sort of dominated by by um, by this sort of pessimistic fatalism where you know um, you know uh, we're all going to die and there's nothing we can do about it. And so if someone actually says, well, no, there's a lot we could be doing, and we could be curing cancer, we could be curing Alzheimer's, it's not acceptable that one third of the people at age 85 are suffering from dementia. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and generally speaking, people don't want to hear that at all because um, they've sort of resigned themselves to, we are in the developed world, this is it, this is what's done, and maybe there can be some redistribution and uh, definitely can't be any more progress. And I think that's a conception that I want to powerfully resist. So um, besides thinking really hard, what are some ways to tell and differentiate between a fictionally small market and an actual market that's small? Um, well, it's, it's, there's always a, <coughs> there's always a, uh, um, I, don't, I don't think it's simply an analytic question, but I, I, I do think we shouldn't underrate the importance of, or the ability to think through things. Um, and it's, it's, 
it's, in general, I think these are not purely empirical questions. If you try to measure it, try to figure it out, um, that will take you too long and you will, you'll never make it. So I, I think it often, um, in my mind, comes down to is there a really coherent narrative? Do I believe the story? Does the story sort of stick together? And, uh, and then you, know, you ask, well, is the market really the size you say it is? Um, and so I, I, like, um, I like very compelling uh, narratives uh, where they work. Um, you know, certainly one, one form this is often taken in the area of, um, of tech has been uh, doing uh, new things on, on somehow a very small scale where they then build out in concentric circles. So it's like Amazon started with just, just a bookstore that had a you know, much broader selection of books and then gradually expanded from there to other forms of e-commerce and sort of built it out in, in concentric circles. Um, um, I would say the uh, one other dimension besides market size that I would that is perhaps worth stressing is you also need to uh, whatever market you're going after what you have to have has to be significantly better than the next best thing and and sort of the you know vague rule of thumb I give is um, you should have a product that's at least ten times as good in some important dimension than the next best product so you know PayPal alternative PayPal was um, cashing checks took seven to ten days PayPal you could do it in sort of well within one day um, Amazon you had a bookstore with ten times as many uh, books as the next biggest bookstore anywhere in the world um, and um, and so uh, so it's it's important to have this very noticeable delta between you and um, and what other people are doing if you're sort of half a percent better ten percent better twenty percent better that's not good enough because you're always going to be uphill you have to, you know, it's always, it's always, um, it's always a combination of technology and the communication of technology, and um, and if you're only slightly better than the next best thing, um, you're never even going to get started because you won't be able to convince people of it. Okay, one or two more. Um, maybe get somebody. Yeah, one IT. So. Um, Elon Musk, he started uh, companies in aerospace, automotive, maybe transportation soon, and solar. So those are all like super competitive industries. So my question is, why isn't he a wimp and why isn't he a loser? Because he obviously isn't. Um, no, I, I certainly wouldn't, would, I certainly would never describe Elon <laughs> in those terms at all. <laughs> and um, I mean, there's sort of, there are many, many, uh, many Elon stories I could, uh, I could tell, um, but oh, uh, go they, for it. Just one. They they all would have they would all have the common denominator that uh, uh, you know um, you know it's uh, that it's uh, it's all sort of uh, yeah really really crazy in one way or another. Well, I'll, t I'll tell one. We were, I was I was I was talking to him um, summer of two thousand eight about Tesla, and I was asking Elon, um, you know, when was the last successful car company built in the U.S. pre-Tesla um, you know, that it actually worked, and the last comp successful new car company in the US at the time had been Jeep which was started in 1941 it was sort of heavily subsidized by the military in World War II and so there had been no new car company in 69 years uh, and I said, you know, is, is that a bad fact or a good fact and it was well it's, you know, it's uh, Elon's was the glass half full quarter full one tenth full was you know it's about time for a new a new car company now now what I would what I would say um, to answer your question more directly, is that um, in both space and cars, which are the two main ones, I think Solar City was a little bit different, but the two big ones were Tesla and SpaceX. Um, I would argue the competition was actually pretty weak. You know, the big car companies in the U.S. massively screwed up on every, you know, on every level. And so he sort of uh, picked. He, he didn't try to create a new search engine. If you're competing up against Google, that's that's. I would discourage you from doing that. You know, I invested in two search engine companies over the years. It's impossible to compete with Google. Um, competing with General Motors, Ford, that sounds a little bit more feasible. Um, and then you know, on the on the rocket side, you're basically competing with these uh, these sort of very corrupt, half government, half private, you know, aerospace conglomerates that have become these kludgy, super inefficient kinds of businesses and. Um, and so there was actually you know, a real opening for SpaceX uh, to do something new. Um, you know, I think one of the forms that innovation, innovation takes all these different forms. And we often think of innovation as you know, sort of a lot of incremental improvement, which is uh, which sort of like you sort of improve things along a curve. This is sort of a very common way that we see innovation. Occasionally you have sort of the brilliant breakthrough 
where it's just you have this eureka moment, you come up with something new. But I think one modality of innovation that's very underrated is what I describe as complex coordination, where you take a lot of different pieces and you put them together in, uh, in just the right way. And so if you ask, you know, what was innovative about Tesla or, uh, or SpaceX, there was no single component that was actually new. It was, you, know, they, you had all these different components, but you just redesigned everything from scratch. And, um, and that sort of a complex uh, coordination is a form of innovation that's extremely rare. I think that's what, uh, I think that's what uh, Jobs uh, did with Apple with the iPhone. There was no single component of the iPhone that was new. So you pulled all the pieces together, you built the entire manufacturing chain, and you all of a sudden had a smartphone that worked, and you had a giant lead over, over everybody else. Um, and I think, I think having achieved that with both Tesla and SpaceX, I actually think it will be quite hard for any of these companies to catch up because it's not, you know, to, for BMW or Mercedes to catch up with Tesla, it's not a matter of com, um, copying one or two pieces. It's, it's really re-architecting everything. Um, and that's, I think that's not even a mindset people have. So, and again, you know, Elon would have said it was not a, you know, it was not a car, it was the first electric car. So again, there's a category question too. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's do one more. Um, go ahead, Bob. <coughs> Might as well wait a sec. Here, here comes one. Thanks, Mary. Uh, this is a journalism school. I'd, li I'd like to ask you a bit more controversial question. Uh, you invested in Palantir, as was mentioned. You were partnered with the CIA. You didn't have a customer for three years. The CIA provided uh, not much, but $2 million funding, but they gave you the big contacts in government. As a result, Palantir is now mining the data for the entire national security apparatus, and even the Los Angeles Police Department. So here you are, a libertarian who's been suspicious of government. You mentioned the founders, but the founders of our, that gave us our Constitution certainly had a great concern about privacy and individual sovereignty, fear of government. And yet Palantir, your company, is now a private company, so we can't ask get too much information about it, involved in secret contracts with surveillance agencies, right, mining the data of not only the American people, but people throughout the world. And in light of the Snowden revelations, aren't you really a, a part of this military intelligence complex that has enormous power and is quite frightening in a democratic society? A lot of different questions embedded in that. Let me, um, <laughs> let me, try, to, let me, try, to, let me try to answer as many of them as I, as I can. So. Um, so certainly, um, um, certainly as a uh, as a uh, as a libertarian, I believe uh, that um, that uh, civil liberties are very important. I believe privacy is very important, um, uh, and I think that uh, there are you know, there are there's something very ambiguous about information technology, um, and people have had they've had very different views of what the future of the computer age looks like. You know, in the 1960s, people thought it would it would lead to sort of a centralized one world state where the state got to monitor everything it was a Star Trek episode from the original series where you had the planet Beta where it was run by a computer and the computer has been running the whole planet for 8,000 years and uh, sort of a peaceful, docile, very uncreative, somewhat you know, softly totalitarian place. You know, by the late 90s, the uh, future of the computer age was seen as sort of cypherpunk anarchy. Uh, you'd have uh, encrypted stuff everywhere. Everything would be sort of radically decentralized. And so in the 60s, computers would centralize. By the 90s, they would uh, decentralize. Um, and I think in a weird way from, you know, 98 to 2015, we've again come all full circle back where people think of computer technology as having this sort of transparent but centralizing effect where you have a lot of uh, concerns around, uh, around privacy one way or another. So I, I do think information technology um, is ambiguous. It can be used. Uh, it can be used to secure things cryptographically and increase privacy. It can be used uh, to, uh, to 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 also make things um, make things uh, more uh, more transparent and in some some respects less private. Now now with respect to the uh, with respect to the national security uh, question in in this country, it is it is my view that um, that we basically that um, that if we do not use uh, information technology um, in, you know, in, the, in, the, in the fight against terrorism and things like that, um, you know, what will happen will be you will get more terrorist attacks and you will get low-tech responses to them, which is what happened after 9-11. And as a civil libertarian, you know, the ACLU will never protect you 
after something bad happens. Because when, when you have an event like 9-11, the politics changes, um, you know, and you get something as toxic as the Patriot Act gets passed. And at that point, it's always too weak. And so it's imperative uh, from a libertarian perspective that we use these technologies to, uh, to try to, um, to, try to uh, narrowly focus on suspicious behavior and prevent it before it happens. And that's how we will have a world that, uh, that, protects, uh, that protects more uh, civil liberties in one way or another. Now, I have a very different perspective on the, uh, on the Snowden NSA uh, revelations more generally. Um, and you know, what, what, I think, what I think is remarkable about it is how little was being done with all the data. I mean, it, it, you sort of get the sense the NSA was hoovering up like a, you know, like a vacuum cleaner all the data all over the world. But you know, there were no, I mean, there were no exploding cigars. There was no James Bond type stuff. There was, you know, um, supposedly Obama had, you know, had spied on uh, Chancellor Merkel's cell phone. I'm sure that was even news to Obama, right? It's like, it's, it's, so we had like this sort of manic data collection that was not actually being used in any actionable way. And, and what, I, what I would suggest you have to, the way you have to think of it is that it was a sort of a bureaucratic momentum where it's like, we're really stupid, we don't know what to do with any of the data, and therefore we get more data. And then uh, you get even more data, even more warehouses full of data, uh, and, then, uh, and then you say, well, we still don't know what to do with it, so we need to get even more data. And, um, and so that the, the antithesis to something like the NSA, um, if you could figure out more sophisticated ways to identify things, then I think you'd have far fewer uh, privacy violations than we do today. I think you have an appalling uh, reduction in privacy in, um, in, in aviation. You know, air travel uh, is, is uh, and it's, it's, it's massive reduction in privacy, very little improvement in security. And that's sort of, that's what a low-tech response to terror looks like. Um, and so I think, um, you know, I, of, I often define technology as doing more with less. Um, and so with respect to this question of national security and privacy, technology means um, more security with fewer privacy violations. Um, and, then, and, then, and, then, and then again, because we're living in a non-technological world, uh, we, the, it always gets framed ideologically. And the ideological debates in our society are never more with less. They're always more with more or less with less. And so the ACLU version would be we'll have less uh, secure, we'll have less security and uh, more privacy protections. The, um, the, um, the, the military intelligence complex would be more security and less privacy. And you're always making trade-offs. So the, the ideological debates are always about trade-offs. Technology is about finding a way to avoid a trade-off, and that's and in that sense, I think Palantir represents something that's that's very much at odds with uh, with both the ACLU on the one hand and the uh, military um, intelligence complex on the other, which are just sort of these ideological twins. They sort of you know sort of they believe in the same terms of the debate, whether you're in the ACLU or the NSA, because both sides say that it's just a trade-off that you're making, whereas a technological answer is uh, to find a way to to avoid making trade-offs. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying, mind you, that, there, that we couldn't imagine bad technologies that would be catastrophic. Uh, you, know, you could imagine you know, some evil computer that runs the world and, and is, is, is really, really bad. So I'm not, I'm not a technolo technological utopian who believes that all um, the technology is simply good, that it's a panacea for all our problems. But what I do believe is that uh, without uh, more intense technological innovation, in this and many other areas, there is no good future, period. Can I just have one little follow-up? You partnered, InQtel is a CIA company that invested widely in Silicon Valley. InQtel invested in Palantir at a time when you were the only other investor. If I were, as a journalist, to ask you, well, what did you agree with the CIA at that time? What, what did they say? What did you learn? Did you see any excesses? After all, the CIA is not supposed to spy on American people. What uh, influence did you have on him? What are the issues? Are you at liberty to discuss that? Can you talk about your relation to any of the intelligence agencies? So where is the accountability to the American people? Where, w this is all basically private activity between you and government agencies, including the LA Police Department. Well, I think, look, I think answering all those questions would take us quite a bit of time. Let me, I, will, I will just start by saying that, that InQtel 
uh, is a, it's a venture capital fund funded by the CIA. They act on a standalone basis. Uh, you know, they, they made some introductions for us at the CIA. They did not, uh, you know, they act sort of in a quasi-independent manner. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was, um, and, you know, it's it, it sort of, uh, on most of the questions you asked, it was nothing of the sort that is insinuated in those questions. Um, Peter, thank you. Um, if you ever decide to get back in front of a classroom again, um, you have a standing invitation here. You have extraordinary colleagues, fantastic students, beautiful weather, great facilities. So just standing invitation if you decide to get back into teaching. And, and thank you uh, for joining us today. And being Thanks, <laughs>